Hey everybody, welcome back to Conversations in Pop Culture, and we are back in the saddle once again for another season. And before I continue, I do want to just let everybody know that I am still trying to work on my big thumb toe and making it wiggle like the rest of the other ones because I had surgery yesterday, and I definitely feel like Uma Thurman in Kill Bill Volume 1. So I'm still working, but I promise hopefully by the end of the week I will get the big toe wiggling and all the rest of those little piggies wiggling just the same. And hopefully I will do it in 13 hours or less, but enough about that because I have with me comic creator, John Westhoff. And I think this is your second time on my show. It is. And thanks for having me back. I appreciate the, uh, the invite. It's always nice to uh, have somebody invite you back after the first time. That makes you feel like you, you didn't make too much of an ass of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I do that funny by myself all the time. There's plenty of shows that I'm not allowed on anymore, and I'm okay with that. It's not a big loss. It's not a big loss. Um, but I'm glad that you're back. Obviously, I'm thrilled. And you have two comics being kickstarted right now, and they are Depowered and Drumsticks of Doom. And so I kind of want to talk about Depowered first because that's more my jam. That's the one I'm more familiar with. That's the one that I actually know more about. And it's an anti-superhero comic in a lot of ways where it's kind of like, cool, the, the basic premise, and feel free to jump in, chime in at any point and correct me. Um, all these people got powers and then 10 years later, their powers disappeared and certain people's lives got better. Certain people's lives got worse. Certain people became criminals, but it's not about their actions. It's about their lives after and there's a particular character, I think Dax, whose <laughs> life was not great. And he's struggling to deal with <laughs> all of his things and making ends meet. And kind of an old nemesis, for lack of a better word, comes back and sort of, I think, has somewhat of an answer why powers might have disappeared or it's one less hurrah. So that's kind of, I think, the basic premise. Thank you for pitching it for me. I'll, I'll, I'll be uh, calling you to come uh table with me at some conventions that was a good pitch for gosh it's been at least a year since we talked and i think since we talked i've had multiple failures with this uh with this franchise uh multiple failed crowdfundings uh limited sales but you know what we're back for issue two and yeah depowered in a way uh i i've kind of mirrored what what's in the book you know what dax set out when he got powers that he had expectations of where his superhero career would be it was stripped from him and now he's kind of always been like that guy who pines for the high school athlete days and used to be the quarterback and stuff like that. That's kind of how the, the premise the, of the, the story theme started. Song is uh, glory days from Bruce Springsteen. Absolutely. Glory days plays in the background. I think of that often. It's funny. You should mention that. Yeah. So Dax is, is struggling with life post power. So we've really stripped away all the superhero, but we've left, you know, the drama. So this is a little bit more of a, you know, a drama than an action book, but there is action. Uh, as much as uh, yeah, an yeah, overweight yeah. Uh, ex-athlete could uh, can uh, maintain himself uh, as a uh, as a superhero type person. <laughs> See, the reason why I like talking about this book is that I think you deconstructed the superhero genre. And let's be realistic here. I think indie comics and superheroes, it's tough. You yeah. know, you have things like Batman, Superman, and you just can't compete. Captain America, Iron Man. You know, those things are going to do well just because it's, you know, the mainstay. But then you get things also like My Hero Academia that's in One Punch Man on the opposite side in the anime world that are also mainstays. And this is taking that concept and saying, cool, this is almost if Astro City lost all their powers. Right. And, and th there's been other, you know, books like this, you know, Powers by Brian Michael Bendis is a lot, deals a lot with that, even though. People in that world still have powers, but, you know, the main characters had lost their powers. Not, spoiler for a 30-year-old book. Um, but, yeah, uh, that was kind of what I set out because, to be honest with you, Andrew, it started out as, again, it was it was more about an ex-athlete. Uh, the amazing athlete, uh, Bo Jackson, he used to come into the uh, Best Buy where my friends worked. And I, I would always, you know, we would see him there and kind of construct this story about what his life is like after his, like, career was ripped from him and, you know, what he thought his life would be. I mean, I read his autobiography and, you know, he was just on top of the world until, you know, he wasn't. And, and I don't know for, for sure how he feels about it. I'm sure he's, he lives a great life, 
but I kind of, you know, that story kind of planted in my mind a little bit. And then I was like, well, I don't think anybody's going to really read a story about, you know, an ex athlete. And I kind of had this superhero story that was, you know, but, but you're right. Like indie comics, superheroes, it doesn't really work. And then I realized, Oh wait, they're kind of the same story. Uh, let's mash them together and see how they work. And that was kind of how the seed started up the story. Cause again, to do a straight superhero book, I, that wasn't something I wanted to do personally. Yeah, no. And, and I like it because obviously, you know, we get a tragic hero. I'm sick and tired of heroes that are perfect. <laughs> and I'm sick and tired of things that aren't real. You know, I hate to say this, but you look at Batman, you look at Superman, you look at Captain America, Iron Man. They all have money. They all have fame. They all have all this great stuff going on. And it's nice to see a hero or a once hero struggle also being on the B team and being like a B or even a C level hero. Yeah, too. there you go. Go lower. And, <laughs> and so it's kind of nice to see that. And then it's kind of like, you know, great. Now they're just trying to get back into society because you can read this on multiple levels where somebody had a job and, you know, going back to the, you know, ex athlete thing, it's kind of like somebody played in the major leagues for five years and then they got an inj injury. And now they're, you know, saying, what do I do next in my job or my career? Because I only knew X and it's so interesting. But then we get the question of why did their powers disappear? And then he runs into an old nemesis who may or may not have the reason why, or he just might be screwing with him <laughs> for, for the sake of screwing because he wants one last jab at his old hero 10 years later. And he also, you know, maybe Dax also is having a mental breakdown. And that's also in play to some degree. And yeah. so we don't really know, or maybe Dax just wants one last hurrah to be the hero he never got to be. And it's very interesting when you start throwing all this out there because it can go in any direction. And I don't know the direction it's going in, but clearly there's a lot of different ways this can go. And so it's fascinating to see that because everything's in play. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that. Again, haven't gotten to talk to a lot of people about the book, so it's so nice to hear somebody who picked up on all the themes because you're right. You don't want to just dump everything in the first issue. You want to leave some mystery and intrigue. Now, it is only a three-issue series. You know, again, we've had, we've had some struggles here getting the book going, so I have to be realistic on how long it can go. You know, I think it was originally, I think I originally pitched it as five issues and then kind of truncated it a little bit. You know, we're going to tell a real tight story about, you know, what happens after Dex gets accosted at, at his hotel room, something stolen from him. How does that play into where his powers were and everything like that? And you're right. Is it just him and his struggle and, and, and being a, you know, kind of a piece of crap after, <laughs> after losing his powers? Or is it, you know, something bigger like, you know, a villain or something like that? We'll have to see. Yeah, so let, let's actually dive into this, too, because obviously the first one, I think, the kicks that he did was rough. And that thing didn't get success funding. And I think that you aimed high on the first Kickstarter. And obviously that didn't work. And then I think you self-funded issue one. And then obviously issue two had some issues. And so what is this like? Because I think it's a real complicated issue when you go out there, you throw out a book and people aren't ready for the book or for whatever reason, it doesn't catch fire or whatever reason you're brand new to something. And then even picking yourself back up because it's tricky. And obviously I ran a Kickstarter for this show and there were moments where I thought, cool, I wasn't going to make it. And if I didn't make it, it's not the end of the world, but it's also, you know, you don't want to fail. I don't think anybody goes in with intention to fail on any project, but it's rough when, there isn't support there. And so what yeah. is that like? Because it's tricky. And, it, even and you know what honestly was, and what was really hard is I didn't, I didn't take time to catch my breath, lick my wounds and say, what's the next step. I probably should have just relaunched the Kickstarter at a lower goal, you know, adjusted the book based on that. Uh, but instead I went to Indiegogo thinking, you know what, most of the backers from Kickstarter will transfer over. They didn't, didn't get there on Indiegogo either. And then, then I did straight sales. So, there was some success in there, right? I had 127 backers in the first campaign. I probably set the goal too high for a indie superhero book that was a little hard to sell. I probably should have been more realistic with the goal. Uh, and then at least I would have had a base to go on. You know, so so to me, I still knew there was people who wanted it out there. I just couldn't get them to convert over to direct sales. And and we've had, you know, you know, almost 100 
sales of the book so far, you know, through other Kickstarters, people have picked it up along the way. So that's what made me more confident for issue two is that like, okay. Let's actually dive into that too, because this is one of the things that I think is really tricky, you know, setting the goal at the right price, because if you need 2,500 and you set it at 500, you might find, but you only might get to 2,000 dollars extra. Or if you set it at 2,000, you might only get to 1,800 and you're still $700 short, but on Kickstarter, it's all or nothing. And Indiegogo, it's a little bit more flexible, but, you know, depending on just what you're comfortable with, where your audience is, you know, obviously you pick one or the other. Um, yep. And so what is this like to figure that out? Because I think that's massively tricky is that because some Absolutely. people say you should really ask what you need, because yep. I think it's better that you get what you need or the minimum of what you need versus being short 500 bucks and then having to figure out where am I going to find another $500. But at the same time, there's also the algorithms where if you set your goal at a hundred bucks and you're funded, now you get a 3000 or 8,000% funded position if you then reach a certain number. And so it's very tricky this because it it's can be really tricky. And this, this is now the, the drumsticks and depowered one is I think my 14th Kickstarter, like my 16th crowdfunding maybe even more than that. I can't even remember in the last 12, 13 years, but it's at least 14 Kickstarters alone. A couple IGGs in there and, and, and other, there was some way back in the day I used. So it's always difficult. I always try to go about 80% of what I need because I can recoup the rest depending on what the budget is for the book. I can handle it. I, I have, I'm gainfully employed. My wife is gainfully employed. So if I have to kind of recoup some afterwards, that's fine. So I started when we started part-time comics you know my previous endeavor i had done a lot of funding the books on my own and this time i decided you know what i need to set it closer to the goal so that i'm not having arguments with my spouse about money or stressing about it afterwards i'm going to try to get to where as close as where i need to be so first two crowdfunders great they both raised over two thousand dollars so this one I, i said okay we have momentum now we've had two successes let's aim high let's go for four thousand dollars that's what this book needs and again, I kind of overshot uh, by almost 50%. The audience wasn't there. I didn't do enough, you know, uh, exciting incentives or variant yeah, covers. Let's, let's actually talk about this too. So I had Tyler Carpenter on yeah. in January. Oh, we are on opposites. This is a good, he's a good example because he's the opposite, right? He'll set a Kickstarter for a dollar and make $10,000. So, you know, he's so different, you know? <laughs> oh, I'm glad I'm glad you didn't say anything bad about this. I love Tyler. I love Tyler. <laughs> Um, I was have a good inf- interview with Tyler. Tyler is just a great individual. Um, but one of the things that, you know, I was speaking with Tom Hutchinson as well, where it took three weeks for a bunch of projects in January to come on where it was below 200, I think, which is very low on Kickstarter. And obviously COVID has changed things. Things have obviously evolved. You know, the part timers or the wannabes, the people said, Hey, I just want to do a comic for the hell of it. Me. And for fun, you know, <laughs> have now left and don't want to do this as a career. So somebody said, Hey, I just want to do a single issue. And it's not about money. It's just about doing it. And I just want to tell a one shot, you know, in COVID, a lot of those entered and a lot of those have left now. I and agree. a lot of people I were looking think- to get their passion project out there and feel bless their hearts. <laughs> and, and you know, if you have fun with it, you can make money with it or you can break even or lose 500 bucks and it's a hobby. That's yeah. great. There's nothing wrong with saying I want to do this as a hobby um, and I want to just get my book out there and see what happens. And if I break even or I lose 500 bucks, I had a good time doing it. Um, but I think what wound up happening in m- from my data is um, it took till I think the third almost fourth week of January for 200 projects and comics to be on Kickstarter. And I think February, it hasn't been a large number. I think it's been significantly less. And I actually think there is less projects on there. And I, I'm a strong believer that a rising tide raises all boats. So when you have more projects collectively on the platform, there's more interest. And I think that's somewhat of a problem because I've noticed a bunch of books not getting the money they need. And not to put Tom's book down, but Bad Kitty did not do great. That book should have done twenty to twenty five thousand, and mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of projects that are not going to pull in good money this year. That should pull in potentially five to eight grand. And so, what is this like? Because I think there's something fundamentally wrong with Kickstarter right now, and I don't think it's a platform. I don't know what's going on 
with people backing. I don't know if it's the economy. People are just scared. People might be burned out from, from, from you know, back in projects. Also, people might just say, look, I'm sort of just done and I'm just waiting to see where the chips fall. But I'm curious how you view it, because it's a little bit different when you're running a project. Yeah, I'll be honest. You know, I, again, I thought with the success in year one and then into, you know, depowered struggle, but then into Drum Six of Doom was my most successful campaign ever in, in by backers and um, a dollar amount. So I thought for sure, you know, now we've got momentum and then issue two. Well, we did a, 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 a zine and an anthology that also struggled to the finish line. We did Drum Six of Doom issue two, which struggled to the finish line. Now I'm seeing the same thing. I'm really like, if I could show you the graphs, I, I was talking to this to about your your next guest, uh, Sean Barber and Matt Knowles, and a bunch of us talk often online. I'm seeing, I used to be the first three days were like big, the, the chart went up real big, right? You get 50 to 75% of your funding in the first three days. That's how I used to, all my campaigns were, most of them. Now it's like you get that one first day and then it's like real slow ticks, real slow, which is still good. I'm not saying I'm ungrateful. But it takes a long time. And I, I really do think you're right. You're very perceptive. There's a lot of factors, right? Economy, uh, the flood of Kickstarter, and now it's gone down a little bit. So you have less people. The excitement was there when people were coming back with their projects. People were excited. Now they're less excited. Uh, there's a lot more projects out there, a lot of us. But I really feel like the big thing to me is the social media squeeze. I think Facebook and Twitter are just suppressing links so much that we just cannot get the word out like we used to that's what i really feel like it is even email i don't get a lot of clicks anymore i don't know if the, the spam filters just send that all to spam i mean uh, i i barely get anybody from from and i have a thousand people on my uh, uh on my uh, mailing list i mean i'll throw something out to you that, that that i haven't actually disclosed is that i am actually backing out of interviewing people in comics because on YouTube and on Facebook and wherever else, and even in shorts that, that I'm participating in, that stuff doesn't get the clicks. Mm -hmm. You know, I could throw up a voice actor. I could throw up a model. I could throw up a wrestler. I could throw up a cosplayer. And, you know, that stuff is going to get 100, 3, 4, 500 views very easily. And I hate to say this, but like people in comics and nothing against any of you guys, but you don't move the needle. And so I'm also... And then I can't be the only one. I can't be the only one. And I think that there's been a change. I also think people have become a lot more selective. And it's an uncomfortable conversation. But I have become very selective in season three. And I'm even more selective in season four now. And so it's like, you know, I don't get solicited. And maybe, maybe, I mean, even when I get solicited for an interview, if 20 people hit me up, I'll take three out of the 20. And I used to take everybody. And so I'm at that stage. I think that's also a big issue where I think relationships have been lost in comics between media and, you know, I guess comics and people in the industry, for lack of a better word. And I think that's a big issue. And I think it's been underestimated because at the start of COVID, and it's just my theory is that everybody was like, we're home. And I think people have forgotten that you need to maintain those relationships. I think that's a part of it. I think you're very perceptive. That could definitely impact it. There's a lot more small publishers. So people are kind of spread out into their tribe, so to speak. So, you know, I'm over here and I'll watch all the stuff that is for, you know, this publisher, but not this one, not, not even consciously like they're hating on them. They're just like, you know, you only have so much time. Right. Um, and there's a lot of people, you know, doing, doing their own shows and stuff that started their own podcasts and all kinds of other YouTube channels. I started one, you know, that died off during COVID too. So I know what that's like, you know, we all were trying to do something different at home to engage. And now it's kind of died off now that things are, are getting a little better. So it's a weird time. I think conventions are coming back. So I think, you know, in person, we'll start to get people excited and remembering. I had my best convention recently in Northwest Indiana Con. People were just excited to see books and buy books. That was, you know, such a good feeling. So I do think that there is some changes. But the, the, the Kickstarter drag is almost across the board. I'll be honest. Like, I don't see, except for people like Tyler, who really you know, are smart with their projects and they set that low goal and they fund really early. Um, but again, like you said, I, I don't like to do that because I feel like I lose some of the excitement from the fan base right after you fund. And, you know, I, I can't be left with a thousand dollars when I need, you know, three thousand dollars realistically. Um, I think I think it's very complicated. And, and at some point I'm going to launch a Kickstarter and I'm actually really thinking with a project where I'm going to be. And obviously 
I'm going to do my surgery first, you know, you know, just so everybody's well aware it's about a six to eight week recovery. So I'm not interested in torturing myself on Kickstarter while not being able. Why not? Just double the torture. <laughs> I, I already can't wait bear enough. I really do not want to carry a Kickstarter across the finish line while my leg hurts. I'm very <laughs> honest about it, about it. You know, there's only so much you could handle in life without going off the deep end. Um, got to know your own limits. That's a good thing. <laughs> It, it, and there's plenty of time. There's there's plenty of time if I'm good by April to launch something in September. There's plenty of time. Um, but the point is that I definitely think that there's a drag in that. And I, I don't really see it stopping. I think that that also backers have changed. And I think there's a lot of things that have evolved. And I also think that there is a issue where is it that you want a cheaper product or do you want something of value? And I think it's very, very complicated because I think there's a war going on, to be quite honest, where I think products have to come down cheaper. And I think that a lot of Kickstarters have been way too pricey. Yeah, I that I agree with. Uh, and, and the way things are going, you know, people are, are pushing that pretty hard. But then again, you know, I've struggled too. And, and, and I feel like we try to keep our products at a reasonable price, but yeah, some of the books they maybe shoot a little too high for where things are in the in the industry. They they price I, their book too much. Um, I there, think there's some of that. See, I think you're going to see variants that were once twenty five dollars have to come down to twenty, if not fifteen. I really do. Oh, I agree. I, agree. I think, think two fifty print runs on Kickstarter are going to have to come down to like fifteen bucks, and that means it's less money. Me and Travis Gibb were speaking about this, where I think it's been priced way too high for way too long. And I think that's going to be an issue. I really think it's coming. And I think that consumers are going to say, look, I don't want to spend $25 on this book. I'll spend 20. I'll spend 15. And I think it's going to be very reflected. And I think it's going to be very complicated when that happens. I mean, I've I've always been like that. I have a hard time. You know, you work hard. People work hard for their money. I, I don't want to charge them that much. I know, like you said, the industry, you know, if you're doing a short print run that, you know, let people buy it if they want. But yeah, I, I don't unless it's somebody I really know or like it's an amazing cover or something like that. I, I mean, fifteen dollars is kind of my limit, you know, on a single issue. Maybe twenty, you know, again, if it's somebody I really want to support. But I can understand, you know, there's only so much people can spread around. So I think it's going to be very complicated, and I think it's going to be a very, very, very interesting thing that happens. And I think in the next two years we're going to see it. But I do. Before we dive into drumsticks of doom, I do want to show some covers. So I know this is issue one. Yeah. And then I know that that, that 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 this is the action figure one. And then I believe, I believe, I think the other one was done by Nick. Uh, I can't say his last name, right? Or do I not have that one? Up? Uh, you don't have that one up. We got on the, uh, well, the, the viewers uh, right hand side there is Chris Thomas Ma did the variant for number two. And on the left, David Jackson did the action figure variant for, for issue one. So thanks for showing those. Yeah. And we, then, uh, then, then, well, I've Nick definitely I've come around to the variant game. I understand that's part of the part of the the thing. I, but you know, ours are you know we usually do double the cover price, so those are twelve dollars instead of six. So we're trying to you know be reasonable. Yeah. So so, so that that's drumstick. No, no, that, that sorry, that's depowered. And yep. we're gonna dive into drumsticks in a second, which is the one I don't know. But even still, what is that like to have an action figure cover? Because that's cool too. I've had a bunch of cool people on who've done action figures. I've had Blair Shed on, who does all the Robotech and a bunch of stuff for Titan. Nice. So what is that like? Because it is a game changer to some degree, where there are people who say, I don't know anything about your book, but I like action figure comics. And I've had a bunch of WWE ones. And even to this day, I feel say, dude, where'd you get that action figure? I'm like, I'm sorry, but it's a comic. <laughs> and so because they look real, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, actually I found... David on, on Instagram and a, a couple other people had gotten, actually, I think Chris Thomas, Ma, who did our variant uh, recommended him. He had gotten one for his book base force. And I was like, yeah, that seems like a cool thing for this superhero book. That's really in style right now. Again, like you said, it's kind of eye catching for people who maybe aren't even interested in the book. They'll see it. So honestly, we, again, we didn't have a variant for depowered on first launch. And I said, you know what, if I'm going to do one, let's do something fun. And you know, it has a little personality, right? Dex has got his little booze bottle in the, in the action figure box. And, you know, it tells a little bit about the story uh, as well. So, and he's in his, you know, he's in his regular civilian clothes or whatever. So yeah, David did a great job. It's a, it's a fun one. So that, that, you know, and like you said about hobby, you know, 
name of the company is part-time comics. I certainly understand this is not my full-time job. So if I'm going to do something, I want it to be something I enjoyed, not just like here's cover one through seven. And I, you know, I had these great artists pump them out. Uh, I want to, you know, it, I want it to, to feel unique and special to the book, you know? And then, and then, then obviously I want to dive into the other side of this whole thing, which is drumsticks of doom, not the ice cream, but the music side of it, <laughs> I, I had to. I'm sorry. I had to. Usually people go with chick, the chicken drumsticks when they uh, joke with me about the book. <laughs> I, I like my ice cream drumsticks. <laughs> it's not I ice cream drumsticks. Them. It's not chicken wing drumsticks. It's the drumsticks, <clears throat> you know, that we play with. I am a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's kind of talk about the basic premise of this because Black Sabbath slayed the Beatles. They became the world's most famous band. And uh, because of that, alchemy and other things are made common in schools and transfiguration and alternative science and demons were summoned. And they all <laughs> kind of stuck around and a heavy metal reigned supreme is what's going on. And, That's it. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, that basically spins off a gigantic music supernatural battle between Lana, who loves music. Obviously, you know, I think Jimmy, who's sort of a bandmate, is there. And uh, they find themselves drawn into a, I guess, proxy music war to some degree is, is the only way I can describe it. And, and, and I'm a little less familiar with this book. than That's now. okay. I think that, that was a great synopsis. I appreciate it. Yeah, Lana wants to play indie music in a heavy metal world, right? And she feels embarrassed to do that. What we would consider in our world pop music, you know, is kind of really, uh, you know, the opposite, right? Heavy metal is the pop popular music. Um so yeah, she just wants to play music. She plays with Jimmy on the side after their heavy metal band gets done with practice. But unfortunately she picks up these magical pair of drumsticks. She doesn't know why they're drawn to her, why they work in her hands and not other people's and some other nefarious characters in heavy metal. They want to keep heavy metal on the top of the charts. So they're coming together. And uh, we're already, again, this is issue three. So, you know, a lot of this, we're not spoiling the story. A lot of it's out there already. Uh, we have catch up tears and everything. If, if you didn't catch the book, but yeah, it's, it's, had I known people would be so hungry for heavy metal books, I would have done this 10 years ago because it's, it's been such a great thing for our, for our company and for Dan and I, my co-creator, Dan Doherty. It's such an easy sell at conventions. People get excited about that short pitch. Like you just read. Let's give into this a little bit more. There's obviously werewolves, there's cults in there. There's more cults in there. There's all sorts of fun stuff. And you mentioned something where if you knew it was going to be this popular and people wanted it, you, know, you would have done it 10 years ago. What is that like? Because I hate to say this, but I don't think anybody knows what's going to be popular anymore in comics. I mean, it, it, it's easy to some degree. You know, sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll give an example that has nothing to do with comics. I knew that 90s show was going to be one of the most watched things on Netflix. Whether it's good or bad, I knew it was going to be one of the most watched things on Netflix. But that's different than understanding people wanting something brand new and original. And so what is that like for you? Because it's pretty, I must, it, it, I guess it must be very nice because it's like, oh, snap, people want this. And it's an original idea and you couldn't have known. I mean, walking yeah. into it, you're like, I think I'll make money with this. I think it's a good story. But for it to take off the way it has is kind of interesting, I think. And I would imagine, like, oh, snap, especially was- when you compare it against the power. Yeah, it was very, oh, snap. Uh, I'm not a confident person. That's just not who I am. It's something I've worked on. I'm a social worker by trade. And even as a social worker, I still have my own issues. So I always go into these things, not with a ton of confidence, but I knew that I had a great co-creator. I mean, the, the art, Dan, and, and the amazing cover artists we've gotten, I knew I knew I had a good package there. I just kind of had to sell people on the story. And honestly, it, it was a story I started, you know, seven, eight years ago. It really started as, as a more down-to-earth story, really about me starting in comics after I had been in a band and kind of transitioning out and and kind of getting to that point where I never really had these lofty goals that I was going to play big stadiums or be in, you know, signed to a label, but you kind of get to that point where you're like, well, this didn't really work out how I wanted it to. And I, you know, my friends and I, you know, we, we were going to be in a band forever. Right. Well, you know, I got to a certain age and it just wasn't happening anymore. <laughs> so that's how the story started. It was about a character who was struggling with being, you know, transiting through music. And then again, just like Depowered, I'm like, nobody's going to read that. You know, I'm not Jaime Hernandez. I can't make people read about, you know, emotions and, and these kind of dramatic stories. I need werewolves. I need, you know, action. I need, you know, wizards. 
and then that's when I brought in the 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 kind of universe changing with Black Sabbath becoming the most popular band. So again, I always try to I kind of try to hide the 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 emo part of the book with these you know fantastical elements, and that was where it started. But again, I sat on it for a long time because I just I didn't know where to go with it. I wasn't confident in it, and and I wanted to approach Dan about drawing it. We, he and I have been friends for about a decade, and I just never really. And then finally, I said, you know what? I'm getting old. The Crypt Keeper's coming for me someday. I, if I'm going to do it, I got to get off my ass and do it. So finally. And so let, let's actually talk about that, too. Because <laughs> it's interesting when you say, cool, we're going to go do something now. So obviously, I turned 30 a little while ago. And I'm doing a bunch of stuff now. Part of the surgery, very honestly, is because I'm 30. And I said, you know, if I don't do this now and fix my foot from, from, from a failed surgery, chances are I'm never going to do it. And I've had enough. Oh, I'm not saying it's easy. It's it's not easy, but yeah, you know, I just said, you know, I guess we're doing this. And I made a bunch of decisions in the last probably month and a half. So I turned 30 on uh, last January 10th. And so now I'm saying, cool, there's certain things I want to do, and I'm gonna go do it. On um, because I realize that life is gonna catch up on me relatively quickly. So what is that like? And then also, I mean, with your book in particular, I mean, obviously it's music related. I think it's familiar as well. And so I think that's one of the things why this thing is successful is because it's a bunch of people who have not had a heavy metal book in their life. And they're like, cool. Now I have something that I didn't get shoved into a locker, but I wasn't, you know, the jock in high school. And now this is for me. And I think that's something that's sort of happened. And it's a subculture and a subset of nerd culture and of music culture and things of that nature. And you're providing an answer or part of an answer to people. Hopefully. I, I think that's why people get excited and they're like, oh, my, you know, my dad listens to heavy metal or I, you know, I like, uh, you know, bands like this. Uh, somebody came up to me at the booth, you know, Iron Maiden shirt. That's an easy sell, right? Oh, we got a heavy metal book for you. I think people have been looking for it. And honestly, again, I feel like I maybe sat on it too long because there's been a ton of books, you know, Murder Falcon and, and the roadie from Tim Seeley. And, uh, you know, I actually talked to my buddies like, should I even put this out? Like, this is going to be you know, one in one of a hundred books out there now like this. And they were like, no, you know, tell your story as long as your story is, is authentic. You know, there's going to be crossovers and similarities, but uh, it seems like a lot of people are wanting, and I wanted those books. Like this book is inspired by, you know, Scott Pilgrim and, you know, the music in that book and, and, and a book called on my shelf back here, Doom Boy and uh, Moonhead and the Music Machines. These, these, these amazing books. Uh, Dave Chisholm has a book right now called Chasing the Bird, which is about a, a trumpet player. Charlie Parker and just these these people who can they can put music on the page without sound it just it's always astounded me in comics it's always been my favorite thing so about 10 years ago I got together with a bunch of other comic creators who I found also played music like myself and we made a, a, an anthology called Banthology and I just love that process because I just love music <laughs> and creating music but if I can't do that anymore well let's create stories about music in that process and and so, i wanted to do this book since you mentioned something interesting where your book there's books similar to it but you still put it out and that's fascinating because i mean some people wouldn't put it out some people want to put out an original concept but also i think there's an argument to be made saying look if there's 10 books that are similar to this somebody's going to pick up that 11th book because they like that <laughs> genre you know, my, my experience is that, you know, and I don't know how you feel, and I'm going to take something outside of, uh, we, we could use music, we could use anime, television. If I like a particular series, I look for more genres in that series, right? And even if it's similar, I still want more of that if I like it. So I'm a big sports anime guy. And so obviously I look for sports animes that are similar. I'm right now watching Manglo Box. I'm looking for a series that's similar to Mango Box, even if it has the exact same concept with a little twist, because I know I'm going to enjoy it and I know what I'm getting into. And I think that's something that's super interesting about what you put out there. And that's that's ultimately the conclusion Dan and I came to is like, again, if we're doing, you know, we're not blatantly reading other people's books and taking stuff from it, you know, we're, we're trying to tell our own story. And I think it is unique enough. But yeah, I just rattled off four or five books. You know, again, I love music themed comics why not make one because again at the end of the day uh that's what i want to do i want to put out the books you know that i want to see in the world so uh you know again thankfully i got a world class illustrator dan also uh, is in a band dan plays guitar he sings 
so obviously getting an illustrator who who understands music and can draw the equipment and understands you know what it's like to be in a band was a huge part of it too so again yeah you're right i think it is becoming its own genre and that's cool to me i want to be part of that subgenre of comics which there are many things of right uh why not yeah, no. <laughs> i think i think i think it's very 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 important and i think a lot of people are looking for the next original thing and i think that is a failure because there's plenty of money in comics and you know people want the same shit for lack of a better <laughs> word um, and, I, and I, I think I think it's a real problem. I mean, you know, not not to put Travis out, but he wrote a book supposedly similar to Nocturna by Scott Snyder. And then he said, well, Scott did it better. But my argument to Travis and not to put him out on the spot and hopefully he's not going to mind is <laughs> why wouldn't you want to put out a book that's similar to that and see, you know, because I guarantee you that you bought Scott's book might also buy your book. And you have a little bit of a different twist to it, and they're probably going to like it, and they're probably going to want it. I mean, there's plenty of books. I mean, there's a book called The Massive, and The Massive is very similar to No Country by Charles Soule and Scott Snyder. Hmm. And there you go. And, and I mean, they, I can name so many people who have similar books. Well, there's so them. many like fantasy books that you know they use a lot of the same tropes and stuff, like you said, to kind of give people familiarity. You know, there's going to be elves, there's going to be dwarves, but. Why do people? Why are people comfortable with that? But then, like me, I was like, "Well, Tenacious D has a movie called The Pick of Destiny. This is called Drumsticks of Doom. That's too similar, you know. If if we avoided <laughs> every single thing that was similar, again, if if I wrote a book and I was like, okay, it's about space wizards with light swords, and they use this thing called the farce. Obviously, I'm stealing, <laughs> you know that. So that's don't do that. But again, if you're if you really if the characters in the story and the story, you know, has heart and, and has honesty to it, that's what's going to speak through in the end anyway. Uh, uh, that's what people I, I mean, I'll be very for. honest. I mean, I mean, I mean, for, for those who don't know, we're going to be talking about ownership. We're going to be talking about a lot of stuff um, tomorrow. Me and my friend Chris Brown and, you know, Chris. Um, and then at a later point on my other show called Embolden, one of the episodes is that are you writing to make money? Or are you writing for to write something that's good? Because you could write something that's bad that'll make money and make you very wealthy. Or are you trying to write a masterpiece? And the reason why I bring this up is that you can take the basic concept of Star Wars, change half of it, and there's a formula to write something that'll make money. Which is what Star Wars did, right? They took Westerns or whatever. And, and, you know, they, they, kind of, yep. they did that too, so... <laughs> Look, look but, at you know, again, like Tolkien, pe people take a lot of Tolkien lore and we're OK with that. Like he created all this lore that people, you know, use in their books now. But if I take lyrics from Ronnie James Dio, am I seen as a ripoff? But he created his own lore. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, the Mandalorian is Lone Wolf and Cup. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's brilliant. They, they Star Wars it, but it's not an original story. By any stretch of the imagination. And if you think it is, I just ruined your day. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, you're welcome. You're welcome. But yeah, I think it's really interesting. And I think I think a lot of people need to get out of their own way. Um, but I digress. I do want to show the covers though. So I want to get into some controversial stuff. So obviously there's some covers here, and then there's some of this right here, too. Yep, that's series artist Dan Doherty. We finally got him on a cover. Uh, we've had some other great ones from Maria Wolf. You saw Brian Trilla there, Caitlin Smith. Uh, Kelly Williams, uh, Matt Festa. We've had an awesome, I mean, uh, I may not have the most confidence in myself, but I do have confidence that I know how to pick amazing artists who can draw amazing heavy metal art. So at the very least, again, if you plunk down your dollars for this, you're going to get amazing art. So I'm happy. Yeah, and then, then, then let, let's actually talk about the campaign itself because it's for both issues. And that's yeah, and I, I'm interested to hear your perspective on how you, you feel. You know, you're someone who watches Kickstarter closely. Is this something you see a lot? Um, so, so I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, this is this is my take. I'll be very honest. I think it's actually smart, um, in certain circumstances. If you know you have a book that maybe is going to struggle to get over the hump, and you have a winner, and pairing them together into one campaign, it's not necessarily a bad idea, um, because you know that you know. Let's say that you know twenty percent is going to be interested in deep power, but the eighty is going to be interested in drumsticks of doom you know you're going to get funded for both of them also my my take is time is money and running campaigns is difficult um i also think that if i mean i'm going to put ben dunn on the spot 
<laughs> um, ben just launched um, like the early stories of Tomorrow Girl. He just finished the first volume of that, and he's running one like two weeks later. Okay. I would have rather him done both of them at the exact same time in the same campaign because I feel like you're going to bleed your backer dry and that it's a punishment. This is what me and Tyler were speaking about when you're running so many campaigns versus combining them so that people can get it and then you give them time to refill the coffers. And I think it's a real problem. So I agree I with you. It, we had a lot of crossover backers in multiple campaigns. I have a lot of long time friends and fans and, and, and family member who supported over the years. So why not? I know I'm going to have at least 40 to 50 that back both. And then, like you said, I have a strong campaign and I have one that's struggling. So why not put them together? And again, I feel like they work together. Like if they were completely like, Hey, this is a, a, a kid's board book. And this is a, you know, adult, you know, anime titty book, then maybe that would have been a poor, poor choice. I felt like these worked, uh, but it is hard to pitch two books at once. So I was kind of, Hesitant, but I ultimately came to the same conclusion, like you said. Time is money. I can't run five campaigns this year. I just don't have the energy, the time to do it. So I knew I had two books that were basically done at the same time. This is a good time. Both of the miniseries are in the middle of their run. So why not right before they both go to trade paperback? Do you, uh, you also feel do you also feel that running five campaigns is too much? I mean, I mean, and, and this is just my opinion where I don't think you know, I know a lot of creators who are running one every single month. There gets to a point where, you know, you're now going to be occupying your backer. Yeah. Don't you want to? I mean, I understand that there's could be a lot of money made, but Pat Chan, Pat's coming on, I think, next week, but he's running one every single month. There gets to a point where it's like, you're bothering me with updates. You're, you're <laughs> agitating me. You're on Kickstarter. You have something going on. And it almost looks like a cash grab to some degree. I hate to say it. And I think, you know, you're training your backer. There's a yeah. concept where you can milk the cow or you could slaughter the cow. Yeah. And, and then you, you mentioned Travis Give a little bit ago. He's running, I think, one now and two in March. He's running 17 supposedly this year. <laughs> he is a maniac. Um, but he does different things too, right? He has different creators. A lot of them are like, you know, he's not attached, but he's putting them out. So I get it. He's running a company, a full-blown company. Pat's the same way. Pat's at a level. He could run one every week if he wanted. Um, he's just at another level from other creators. So I'd be in I'm interested to hear your conversation with him about that. But he, yeah, he's just at a different level. Where I'm at, though, I do, I feel like you, you're saying, I don't have the backer base where, like you said, if I run one in January and February and not everyone comes back for the February one, like, Pat, Pat's going to be okay, right? They'll come back eventually. They'll pick it up at a con. Well, but I, I can't do that. I need to have, I need, well, and again, I don't, I don't have the energy and strength to do it either. See, see, I think it's changing though, where I think that deep valued backer is actually becoming less and less and less. And I think it's okay. actually a shift in, in Kickstarter where I think that this is a dying breed. I really do. I see it on the wall where I think you're not going to have that in three, four years. Same thing with Tom to some degree, nothing against Tom. It has nothing to do with the um, product. It has to do with the backer. I think backers have changed. Yeah. Where I yeah. think that they are, backers are going in a very different direction. I mean, I, I definitely can see that point of view. I don't, I don't know if I have the background to say one way or the other, but I definitely could see how that could happen. There's going to be diminishing returns eventually, right? If you do 12 books a year, Eventually, you're going to get some of those backers that just say, enough, I'll get it from you another time. I've, I've purchased a book from you every month this year. You know, So I, I, to me, I to answer these... your question at the beginning, I, I, four is, is as many as I would ever run. Just gives you some time to make sure you know shipping smooth, books are in. That's the um, other thing too. Give them some time to catch their breath, and then if they want to come back again, it, uh, it's and also, build your audience along the way. Also, I think it's the idea like, I didn't get Ben Dunn's Tomorrow Girl yet. So my whole thing is that why would I want to pick up the early years if I didn't get the actual book first? I would like time to actually read it and see if I like the series. And I think that's a big issue. And, and I know I tried to run uh, this campaign right after issue two shipped. And all it took was a month long delay from the printer because they were backed up and I had to back this one up. And then I was actually shipping right as it's launched. And I actually felt bad because some people were getting their books and I don't, I don't necessarily want to be in that position again. I'd like them to be close so that people have it on their mind. You know, they get the book in the mail and they go, "Ooh, what's the next one coming out?" And then maybe I have the pre-launch up, but 
yeah, to me, I, I, I'm not ready for that yet. And again, I don't have the, I don't have the team support either to help. Uh, I know Lori Foster's like that. She runs a ton. She's, you know, running two at the same time right now. Bless her heart. I, I just don't have the, the mental fortitude I, I to make it through. That too. I have issues with that too. I got no problem where I think it's actually detrimental that you can run back to back campaigns or run two at the same time, even if you're a proven creator, because all it takes is one little trip on a pebble. And yeah. now all of a sudden you might be bankrupt and who gets screwed? You don't get screwed as the creator. I get screwed as the customer. Right. That is not customer centric. And to me, I thought Kickstarter said, well, you want to do a project and we are all kick starting it together. And I think actually Kickstarter has gotten away from their mission by opening that up. And I think it actually challenges their core belief. I really do. Yeah, no, I know a lot of creators either run it on a different site like backer kit while they're doing Kickstarter. I mean, again, it's all part of their business model, but you know, I'm I understand not the yet. business. Don't get me wrong. I get the argument. I get when you're talking about big money of 30, 40, 50,000, but sure. if you're a company where your mission was X Kickstarter by definition has actually challenged and changed their mission on what they stand for. And that actually, I have not heard one comic creator actually call out Kickstarter on it. And I think that that on the comic side, it should be called out. I really do. Because yeah. it's that what they did is that they ultimately betrayed every customer by allowing creators to run back to back within like five days. Well, and I remember, um, you know, in the early days of Kickstarter, there was quite a few people who made mistakes and then had to come back to like re-kickstart. I think that gave a bad message, right? Like, oops, I messed up now. Give me more money. They shouldn't have allowed that either, you know. So they're, they're, they've had some some struggles, and you're right. Their mission is much different now. But they've made a lot of good changes behind the scenes and stuff too, so I definitely want to say, you know, I do support oh, I mean, their platform. But <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong. I think Kickstarter is great, but I think there is a real issue with that, and I think that you're going to see it develop. And I, I've been part of, you know, campaigns that have blown up, that have ended poorly, that mm -hmm. people have run away with the money, and we don't have to name names. But there you go. And, and, you know and I'm not getting those books. I'm not getting those books. And, you know, when you're talking thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars, you know, it's yeah. not a lot of it's not money to live on for the rest of your life, but it's still a lot of money. It's thievery. It's not good. But I digress. I do want to talk about another controversial issue. Uh oh. <laughs> so 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 obviously with, with, with comics, um publishing is a big deal. And we were speaking a little bit before, and you could plead the fifth. Um, <laughs> but obviously, what we were speaking about contracts and dealing with contracts and predatory contracts. And obviously, I am not a fan of contracts. I like to read contracts. I think it is massively important when you go and get approached by a publisher to actually fully read what they own, what you own. Tomorrow's episode on Embolden is about ownership. And so I know that you've had your run in with contracts. And so what is your opinion on all of that? Because I think it is very interesting. And I think a lot of creators are very scared to talk about this topic. Yeah. You know, I haven't had a ton of experience with it. My hope with relaunching, I was with a different company before, and then I relaunched a few years ago as part-time comics on my own. My hope was to get some things published. That is definitely a goal of mine. I would like to be under a publishing house. I would love to see, you know, that for my career. Um, but I have found it's not gotten much better in the last, you know, I took a few years off and came back the few times I've been offered. Uh, I did feel like the language in the, in the contract was very favorable for, for the, the publisher, which, you know, which is fine. Um, I, I think, um, you know, if you're entering into a partnership together, you know what, you should agree on, who, you know, what everyone's going to benefit. Everyone should benefit together. If they're helping you get your book out there, and they're doing hard work behind the scenes and they're getting into diamond. Of course they should. But when the language is like, you know, ownership in perpetuity and, um, you know, you ask for minor changes and they are upset about it or, or don't really want to have a conversation or don't even, you know, everybody's busy and I get that, but really haven't even had a conversation with you by phone or in person to talk about it. it just kind of gives you a, a bad vibe that they're just like, okay, I read your pitch. I'm ready to, publish your book and there's no discussion Ooh. about like the schedule Let, it's just see. been a very weird um thing and i've heard this from a lot of other people behind the scenes again no names you know people can keep their own information but 
a lot of these these publishing houses are like that. They want to suck up your IP, it seems like, and get some benefit from it. Hope it gets picked up, and then they get the rights, so you know, partial rights to it. Do Do you think that it's a comic play with the IP, or do you think it's more along the lines that they want to pick something up and then either sell it to Hollywood or sell it yeah. to Disney or it, sell it to Hulu? Because yeah. what I'm viewing, it feels like that to me from what my peers I've talked to, close peers. Who've had contracts, um, the contracts I've read myself, which again are very few. I want to be honest about that. Um, it does feel like that. Like they want enough IP under their name that if one or two hits, they're good, right? Even if they get a percentage of it. And oftentimes in the contract, it's a large percentage when they're not, again, they're the publishing house, right? They're not really advising. They're not providing editors. They're not giving, most of them don't give any money at $0 up front. You pay for all printing costs. So the risk isn't really on them, although they're paying, you know, in advance, the, the, the cost will come back to the creator. So it's, it's it, the ones I've seen are just, yeah, very disappointing. Um, but again, it's still a goal of mine. I don't want to trash the industry in general. I'm sure there's good ones out there. But from what I'm hearing from, you know, my close peers, it's just, it's just not a good landscape for comics. And, and, and you're talking tomorrow, so I won't take the topic away, but I think ownership is important because, in so many other industries, the the avenue to get your work out there in music, TV, film is so controlled, you would have no control over it. In comics, you can't. You at least in comics, you can like I own this book a hundred percent with with Dan. We split it. Okay. If, why am I gonna give that away freely without some assurance that I would benefit from it <laughs> long term? It's very interesting and and I mean, you bring up a whole point. I'm a big, you know, and people hate me for this. I think NFTs are an answer in a lot of ways. I really love smart contracts. I think crypto is brilliant. Nobody in comics talks about this. I think people in comics are just not informed on it. I also believe in, um, you know, you know, token economics, essentially, which means it's, it's essentially NFTs and basically issuing a token of whatever your brand is, music-wise or art-wise. And I think we're getting there as a society um, because I know that ownership is worth a lot of money. I own this show. So every episode can be licensed out and it has on, you know, um, the, the growth and the economics of this show can be go pretty much it's infinite depending on it's licensed out. And I know a bunch of different podcasts that license out their content. I mean, Joe Rogan is a good example of that with Spotify. And he's not the only one that does it. You just, he's the only one that everybody hears about. So I think it's very interesting. I think ownership's a big deal. And I know people's books that are not that great, that they were picked up by a publisher for movie rights. Mm -hmm. I know it. I know because, because, because the world is good. The concept is okay, but they want the world because what they really want to do is they want to sell it to Hollywood. And I think it's very, very, very complicated. And I get it. I get it completely. But yeah, and, and again, I don't I don't have those avenues. I don't have those connections. I work full time, whatever. If if a company, you know, did that work behind the scenes and got it picked up, I'm fine with that. Right. You you can work on that. But when it's just so blatantly that, you know, they want a huge cut of that pie <laughs> without doing the actual work to build the world or, or any support for you. Like, right. If they were going to give you an advance and say, yeah, work on the book for a year, we'll pay you 10 grand. And, and, and you know, down the road, if you know, we're going to split up the profits like this, but when they're like, we're giving you nothing, put out the book and we're going to take 50%. If we get any big contract, that's that to me, again, feels predatory. I, I also think that a lot of these publishers, unfortunately also lock up your book. So what winds up happening is that, and, and let's be realistic. I mean, depowered. I don't think you're going to mind me saying it. You know, if you went to a publisher and they had a three-year lockup and depowered didn't do good on its first issue, now, you can't touch the power for three years. And I think I understand non-compete because I'm interested in picking up talent for my YouTube stuff and other people. And I'm going to be probably in the next six months, potentially picking up another show and building out a network. Um, so I want non-compete maybe for a year or two years on that. But the idea is that when you have a five year or six year or 10 year non-compete, I mean, you're putting somebody out of business. I think it's very complicated. I mean, I'm a huge wrestling fan. And I just so happen to have this right here, guys. I love it. Um, but but 
they have a 90 day non compete clause. So WWE cut you. You have 90 days where you can't compete and go to AEW. You don't have a five year non wrestling compete clause. And I think that's a massive problem because let's be realistic books can fail and a lot of books do. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And like I said, a contract that I saw was did not even want to have a conversation about the length of that. Because to me, like you said, okay, if you're going to see me through this whole arc of this story for five years, let's work together. But beyond that, if you're not publishing the book or continuing to keep it in print, why do you get it? I mean, you've, you've seen it. There's public cases. Alan Moore speaks about it. Um, you're just holding with Action Lab and they're, they're holding onto their books. There's all kinds of examples of this. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm very naive to a lot in the industry. I'm not speaking as an expert, but from what I've seen, I, I can see why people are not confident to want to participate in this, this industry. Uh, do, because do, it, do, it, it, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you also feel that, I mean, obviously Kickstarter is right now rough, but three years ago, people, when they were making even eight, nine, 10 grand, they might've been making more than a royalty at a comic shop. Oh, and that, that's another thing, too. Even if you're doing six grand or seven grand or eight grand on Kickstarter, you might make even more money just on that, let alone going to a publisher. And oh, absolutely. That- that's, that's part of it, too, that the, 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 the cut, once you take the distributors 20% and the 40% or 30% discount so that the, uh, the LCS can make their money, you really don't, you only have a, you know, a couple dollars to fight over there in the end. So when you're splitting that with the publisher, um, yeah, you're, 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 you could sell 3000 books, which is great sales for an indie book, right? That's amazing. You're going to get 1500 bucks from that. Right. And that's not even enough to pay your artist. Um, you know, depending on the cost of your, your the cover price of your book too. So there there's, I mean, there's other things you can do advertisement things. We know that variant covers help. We know that it's not just about, but yeah, it, it it's, yeah, it's tough, tough to make money that way in the industry. And I think that's why you're seeing so many people on Kickstarter. Cause you have a, you sell 200 books on Kickstarter you've broke even or maybe even made a little profit and then you have books to sell. You do that at, at LCS and you've bombed. You're, they're not even, your book's not even getting published, right? The publisher's going to cancel it. So um, yeah, even, even a thousand books is not, you know, enough really to break even on, if you're paying it, you know, an industry standard page rate, right? Yeah. I, I think, I think it's very complicated and also even just getting into it. And I think that, you know, getting into an indie book into a comic store, and hustling and i think it's very complicated and i think that you know obviously the margins aren't great on this i mean i sell books on ebay i know exactly what a cover a sells for on a retail package so if i pick up you know i mean i picked up uh, chuck and sean's book on a retail package i think it was like 65 dollars um if i sell all those i'm not making a lot of money on it so that's kind of you know that but yeah, there, there you go. There you go. So uh, that that's whatever. But I do want to let you get out of here soon. So I know you got a lot of stuff going on. But I am curious, before I let you go out, where do you think the state of the industry is going? Because that's kind of the question that, you know, we, we were touching upon. But, you know, where do you see Kickstarter going? Where do you see, you know, the next 12 months in comics going? Well, I think you're going to still – continue to see a lot of kickstarted comics even if they're published i mean i have a lot of buddies who kickstart before they launch with their publisher i think that's going to be a lot more common i do think you're going to see a lot of the smaller publishers you know this is again just outside baseball so to speak um you know either close their doors or get combined or things like that we saw a huge explosion in in small publishers uh and even you know brands like mine where it's just you know somebody doing it on their own you know as a sole proprietor you see a lot of that but um i think you know these kind of lower level publishers uh i I don't think a lot of people are going to want to sign with those uh with those publishers they'd rather just do exactly like you said raise their couple thousand on kickstarter and see how it goes um i think you're going to see a shift back to 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 more kickstarting and different crowdfunding you are seeing you know some support for other sites too so uh, I, I do think that, that we're headed kind of back to that full circle, you know? Yeah, no, it's it's going to be very, very interesting. And then obviously I do want to give you a chance to, and I, we could talk about this for hours and, and everybody else can talk about this for hours. And I'm sure at some point this year, I'm going to host a whole round table on this very topic. Um, but 
Um, I do want to give you a chance to self promote. So where could people find you back your project? You need, you know, a few more backers, you know, you know, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a race to the finish line with this one. No offense. No offense. I don't think I'm <laughs> not I'm, at all. I'm used to it now. We're just kind of where we're at and that's okay. You know, I'm grateful. The backers in most projects have, have come by the end. So usually, you know, we get around 200 people. That's always a good feeling. And I'm confident we'll get there again. We've got about two weeks left. Uh, so I appreciate you inviting me on so that we can promote the book. But, I, you know, again, I don't have any aspirations to write Amazing Spider-Man or to be this amazing writer someday. I, I enjoy conversations with people like you and talking about my experience in the industry for the that, past 12 or 13 years. I actually promote the interview <laughs> out. Unlike <laughs> other people, I promote the interview out. You do, but you're also, you know, you're a great conversation. It's nice to be invited. You know, you reached out to me. Hey, let's, we haven't talked in a while. It's just, to me, that's what it's about, you know, making these connections, you know, again, at the end of the day, even if I go broke, I have this cool product in my hand that I made with, you know, friends and, and, and peers in the industry. So, but I can be found at part-time comics with an X on all social media, including the best way to find us is Linktree forward slash part-time comics. You can find all our recent crowdfunding, including this one is always on there. Our store youtube channel all that stuff uh but yeah on every social media just like your pop anime comics we are part-time comics with an x yeah and then, then i'm just gonna promote myself and i've been gonna keep saying it is you gotta support indie and what that means is you gotta back kickstarters you gotta back other crowd funders if you like something and you want to see it get made you should back it especially when it's on kickstarter obviously if you like john's book whether it's depowered or drumsticks of doom the music, not the ice cream. Um, you should absolutely back it because um, it does make a huge difference. And if you don't like it or you're stiff on money at the moment, because a lot of people are, you should definitely follow on social media because that also makes a big difference. Huge. And that's a huge thing. And sharing it out makes a big difference. Um, as far as I'm concerned about me, I'm Pop Anime Comics on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I have a Redbubble t shirt in the comment section. Up above, down below, to the side. It's making fun of Gundam. I also have ad rates up there. So if you're interested in advertising on my show, um, I am worth every penny. I am worth every penny and then some. So, you know, obviously, if you got a project going on, whatever you got going on, I got a bunch of different uh, tiers and whatnot. So if you're interested in that, anybody, feel free to check that out. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much everything I got. And uh, YouTube is a big deal. I have 501 subscribers. I would like to get to 510 by the end of March is the goal. So we're nine away. I think it's an obtainable goal. And uh, so I really appreciate people subscribing on YouTube. It's Pop Anime Comics. A lot of cool content is coming and a lot of surprise content is coming. So including this tomorrow. So oh definitely goodness. check that out as I take 12 of these out and play with them. And uh, who knows, we might be pulling some autographs. Nice. Um, so. That's the goal um, on that. And uh, tune in tomorrow because I got two more interviews tomorrow. And I have Sean Barber coming on in an hour. So that's everything that I got. And I'm going to let you take us out with the final word. No, again, thank you so much for inviting me back. It's been a, a little over a year since we talked. So I do appreciate it. Again, like Andrew said, the shares really help. We understand, you know, times are tough for a lot of people. Social media is really tough right now. So a, a, a share, a retweet. All that stuff really helps if, if you're excited about the book and can't support in that way. You know, we really do appreciate it. And and thanks. Thanks for talking to me tonight. Absolutely. And that is a wrap. <laughs>